about Jordan Mach. I know I did. I worked there when I was 16 years old, which was 100 years ago. So I'm real happy about this. Anyway, um, the Norfolk Council on Aging is very pleased to present Anthony Samarco, the Balzac of Boston history. Thank you, thank you. for being here. I'll give a little introduction. I want to thank you all. I was saying I am staying at my place in Austerville on Cape Cod because of COVID. So I thought, oh, I'll just meander over at about 11.15. I walked the dog the whole bit. Five miles, and all I did was 40 minutes. That was at the Bourne Bridge. So I said, oh, my God, either the summer is starting or there's an accident. So I get there, and there's no accident, so it must be the summer. But who here remembers Jordan Marsh? I think everyone here has a story or some sort of a memory, but this is one of the oldest department stores, not just in New England, but in the country. And when we think of a department store, we have to think of different departments under one roof. So it might include men's, women's, children's clothing, household goods, furs, trunks, as well as, of course, even oriental rugs. But when it was founded in 1851, it would not only go on to be the largest department store, but of course one of the best known. And seen here on the cover, this was the Tower Clock. This is at the corner of Washington Street and Avon Place. This building, built in 1881, would actually be the site of basically Boston's transformation in the Victorian period that had over a dozen department stores in downtown Boston. But Jordan Marsh, in a lot of ways, was really one of the finest. This was a small uh, piece of advertising that was used between 1895 and 1916. And you can see two winged griffins on either side of a central shield. But you see in the very center there's an arm that holds a dagger. I assume that was for slashing prices. But Jordan Marsh and Company was something that not only had wonderful things upstairs, but beginning in 1911, a bargain basement. The company was founded by a man named Eben Dyer Jordan and Benjamin Lloyd Marsh. And Jordan and Marsh were two independent dry goods merchants on Hanover Street in Boston's North End. And beginning in 1841, they both started their businesses, which were independent, and they did very well, but they were within the same block on Hanover Street. In 1851, they joined forces with a capital of $5,000 and moved to Milk Street in downtown Boston, where they opened Jordan and Marsh. And they did so well that within a year, they hired the younger Marsh, Charles Marsh, as the man who handled the wholesale end of the business. And this man would continue right through to 1888 when he died. But during that period of time, as a dry goods store, these were places that provided everything from bolts of material and cotton, sewing accoutrements, laces, and linens. But in that period, they were one of dozens that were located in downtown Boston. Well, after Milk Street, they moved here to Pearl Street, and they took two contiguous stores, 18 and 20 Pearl Street. This was a building designed by Isaac Cruff, a man who actually redeveloped downtown Boston in the 1840s and 50s. Downtown Boston was basically residential. And as Beacon Hill and the south end of the Back Bay was being developed, the area that had once been a very fashionable neighborhood was now becoming four-story red brick commercial blocks. Well, during this period, they weren't just selling local items. And by 1870, they had been located at Winthrop Square in downtown Boston. And this is a trade card, and it shows that Jordan, Marsh, and company, importers of foreign and dealers in American dry goods, were now in the Freestone Building. Well, this was a five-story magnificent granite block that was the biggest commercial block in all of New England. And in that instance, they remained there until 1871 when they eventually moved to Washington Street, and this building was destroyed in the Great Boston Fire of 1872. But in 1876, the 25th anniversary of Jordan Marsh and Company, as well as the United States, they actually used their delivery cart, as you can see here, pulled by six horses bedecked in flowers. And this was in the Centennial Parade of the United States that was held in Boston. And we realized that Jordan Marsh and Company was something that not only provided fine goods, but if they were too large for you to carry home, they'd be delivered to you six days out of the week. 
Well, during this period, the two partners had done extremely well. And as I mentioned, in 1871, they moved to Washington Street between Summer Street and Avon Place. Now, just to the left of the Tower Clock building was the old dry goods store of George Warren. Warren was an older merchant. He had actually built the building in the 1860s. He had been in business since the 1830s. But the idea was he wanted to retire. He sold his business and his building to Jordan and Marsh, and they not only converted it into a dry goods department store, but they had Bradley, Winslow, and Wetherall build the corner building. Now, this was five stories in height, two-story plate glass windows, and it was the epitome of a department store that emulated those in Europe. This was modeled on Bon Marche, which was the biggest department store in London, and hence the biggest store in all of Europe. And seen here in an advertisement, this cantilevered building, because you saw the Avon Place on the right and Washington Street on the left, had, as you see here, people gathering for the entrance at 9 a.m. It was open six days a week, 9 a.m. until 6 p.m. But directly above, in that demi loon window, falls all sorts of mail orders. And you see little angels gathering these mail orders because now Jordan Marsh wasn't just servicing New England. They even sent as far away as California, and they even had customers in Europe because by the 1880s, they had offices in London, Paris, and Berlin. The interior of this store was something that was incredible. It had a five-story staircase. Now, I can imagine what was on the top floor. We'd eventually get there. They didn't have elevators at this point. But the whole idea was that it was not only such a prominent and elegant store, but it was as important to shop there as it was to be seen shopping there. So on that staircase, we would see ladies coming and, of course, going up and down the staircase to the individual departments. Now, when we think of a department within a department store, these were things that were usually a little bit larger than this room. And this is the men's daylight clothing department. This is a department that had at least 12 men. And what they did was to offer clothing that were usually jackets and trousers made in different sizes, but in similar fabrics that you could actually put together to make a suit. And with slight alterations, you could have your suit in less than two days. Previous to this time, one would go to a tailor and a gentleman would have his suit tailored. It might take anywhere from eight to 12 weeks. But Jordan Marsh was one of the first stores in the country to actually begin to offer men's suits that were ready-made and as fine as a tailor could do. But as you see here in the foreground, with stacks of trousers, as well as top coats and all sorts of things for day wear, you shouldn't confuse this department with evening wear, country wear, yachting wear, and sporting wear, because there were departments for every single aspect. By the 1840, 18, oh, 1884 to 1886, they began to publish catalogs. And these were catalogs done twice annually. And this is the spring and summer of 1889. And it would show on the interior upwards of 100 pages of things that you could order by mail order to actually be sent to you. Not only would a dress be tailored, but a suit as well, especially if you provided all of the different sizes. This was something that began to increase Jordan Marsh's profitability because not everyone could get to Boston to actually order from the store. And by the period of the 1890s, this shows Jordan Marsh and company with a cornucopia showing all of the buyers in Europe, the Middle East, and even China sending back all of the goods to Boston that would then be delivered to Jordan Marsh by, as you can see here, paddle boat trained, as well as, of course, horse-drawn wagon. This was something that was an important feature because even though Jordan Marsh was the largest of the department stores, there were at least a dozen department stores. And if you think about it, we might remember Jordan Marsh, of course, Filene's, Kennedy's, Gilchrist, R.H. Stearns, R.H. White, Raymond's, Ellen Slattery, Conrad and Chandler, C. Crawford Haulage. Each of these stores had a good patronage, and each store was very profitable. 
but each one of them began to offer in some ways things that were not only unique, but really quite an interesting thing for your home or clothing. But one thing Jordan Marsh did before any one of those department stores was to offer charge. Now, we have a charge card, but in the period of the 19th century, this was a charge token. And the token, as you can see here, would have J.M. Co. in a circle with two cross sabers and a coronet. I have no idea why there's a coronet there. But in the obverse, there would be a number and it would be assigned to you. You might have a $25 credit limit. Sounds ridiculous today, but in the 1880s, $25 was a considerable sum of money. If you were to purchase something larger, tables and chairs, a sofa, a bed, or even an oriental rug, they allowed you six months of interest-free credit. So it allowed you to pay it off on time. But if it went over the six months, it was 1.5% monthly. This one charge token increased the company 400-fold in less than 10 years because it was extending credit to the aspiring middle class. And during that period of time, we realized that, yes, some people paid by cash, but many people were charging their purchases. Now, the surprising thing about Jordan Marsh was not only did they have the ability to charge, but they also had a pneumatic cash room. Now, this was a room in the basement that had these pneumatic tubes that went throughout Jordan Marsh. They went from each department directly to these women. Now, have you ever been to a bank and you can go in and you put your deposit, it goes in these little pneumatic tubes and comes back to you? We go every Saturday without fail with our dog because when the money comes back, there's a bone in there. <laughs> So as a result, the dog even knows the sound, let alone the sight, of the bank. But these pneumatic tubes allowed a clerk at the desk not to handle money. If they put the money into the thing and the cash came back in an envelope. So the idea was in that instance, five million pneumatic tubes of feet went through all of Jordan Marsh. Now initially, of course, they had a horse-drawn wagon. But by the period of 1912 to 1915, they replaced 144 horses with a motorized delivery service. And this Jordan Marsh and Company truck could now go six days a week, not just through Boston, but even here to Norfolk, usually one day a week it would actually be scheduled for. And large pieces of case furniture, a piano, a trunk, all of these things would be delivered to you by two warehouse men. It was an important feature because now they were competing against all of these individual purveyors of fine goods. Now this is a postcard of 1900 and it says of course the shopping hour. But if you look on the upper left hand side there's a small bronze tablet and it says that it is the busiest corner on Boston's busiest street. Well look at Washington Street. Not only does it have streetcars which connected every neighborhood of Boston and individual cities and towns. But even though it was the noon hour of people taking their lunch break, you also had shoppers and people attending to business. Look at the sidewalks, six to eight people deep on either side. So this was something that before the advent of suburban shopping malls, going to town was an important deal. And in this way, Jordan Marsh began to corner the market because they said, that they were the mercantile heart of New England. And seen here in this little heart with the tower building on the left-hand side and the annex on the right-hand side, superimposed on a map of New England, they truly were the largest department store in New England, but they were also among the most profitable. Seen here in 1895, Ebendiah Jordan was somebody who had parlayed $5,000 in capital into a multi-million dollar company. His partner, Benjamin Lloyd Marsh, had died young, and he had bought out his widow and daughters. When he died, he left over a hundred million dollars, which in 1895 would be the equivalent today of about probably 10.8 uh, million dollars. It was an incredible sum of money. And the business, which was on Washington Street in downtown Boston, 
was an anchor within the community. And seen here on Washington Street with the spire of the Old South Meeting House in the distance, we began to realize that Boston at the turn of the 20th century, with new neighborhoods such as Roxbury and Dorchester and Hyde Park, Rosendale, Jamaica Plain, West Roxbury, Charlestown, and Brighton and Alston had all been annexed to the city so that the new city of Boston, a hundred years after it became a city in 1822, had an aggregate population of 750,000 people, all of whom had wonderful shopping districts on their main streets, but going to town was a major feature. Well, Eben Jordan left his business to his son, Eben Dyer Jordan, Jr. And seen here in a photograph of about 1900, he was somebody who had been educated at Milton Academy and later at Harvard University. He started sweeping the stores, floors. He actually stocked the shelves. And he worked anywhere from 8 to 10 hours a day. And by the period of the six months, he had become a senior vice president. <laughs> he was somebody in some ways who had actually begun not only to learn his father's business, but he would increase it by 400-fold within the period of 1895 and his death in 1916. He was somebody in a lot of ways that looked at Jordan Marsh as not just the family business, but it was something in some ways with the assistance of his vice president, George Mitten, that the two men would actually run this empire and not only make it profitable, but make it well known. They were the people that brought buyers throughout Europe who would go to England to buy rare books and stationery, to go to France to get China and Germany dolls and bring them back to the United States. And they were the people who in some ways continued to increase in some ways not only the availability of merchandise, but a very broad spectrum. And by 1926, when the company itself had actually celebrated its 75th anniversary, not only were they the oldest department store in New England, but they were also declaring through the Boston Town Crier that they had arrived. Now, during this period of time, one of their major competitors was Filene's. Do you remember Filene's? Well, Filene's wasn't really a department store. What it was was a specialty store. It was very elegant. You would see the interior much different than Jordan Marsh, which was more of basically a Victorian cobbled together department store. Filene's, however, was something started by a man named Wilhelm Katz, who anglicized his name to William Filene, get the Katz, Filene, Feline, was somebody who with his sons, I know exactly, I love it, but it's true, they do transfer, translate quite well. But with his sons Edward Filene and his very patriotic son Abraham Lincoln Filene, had wonderful things that were available, but they couldn't sell everything. So what did they do? In 1909, they started Filene's Basement. And if it didn't sell upstairs for $10, it might sell in the basement downstairs for $5. And they also had the automatic markdown system. Of course, Jordan Marsh continued that two years later, and they had their bargain basement. And of course, by the period of the 1930s, at the height of the Depression, we would realize that not only was Jordan Marsh still doing well, and of course, with their bargain basement that rivaled that of Filene's, they started a thing on the first Wednesday of every month. Do you remember Dollar Day? Dollar Day would have a blue dollar bill. And that dollar bill, sometimes, whatever the merchandise was, might be a pair of children's shoes or boots. It could be a pair of gloves. It could be a hat. It could be a pocketbook. Or it could be anything under the sun with whatever superfluous merchandise they had. And in many ways, Jordan Marsh was cornering the market because of their dollar day. Now, during the period of the 1880s, and it would continue right through to the 1960s, Eben Dyer Jordan Jr., who was an art aficionado, would begin the art program. And the art program went for eight weeks on the top floor of the annex. And during that period of time, they encouraged both professional and amateur artists to display their artwork, which they would compete for competitions to be the best, for second best, and third best. But the public voted upon this. And the idea was, because it was on the top floor 
and you had to go up the escalator at that point, you eventually would come down and of course walking on that escalator you would see those sales on every single floor. So the idea was it was marketing as well as advertising. But seen here in 1949, this is Edward Richardson Mitten on the right. He was the fifth president of Jordan Marsh, and there were only five between 1851 and 1963, is presenting an award to a man named Robert Douglas Hunter. Hunter was a very well-known painter, and his paintings today are really quite collectible. This was a painting of his brother, Robbie, and he won two years in a row. The public would vote him as the winner, and of course he would be given a bronze medallion that said the Jordan Marsh Mitten Award. He received a check for $1,000 and lunch at Lockover's. So I can imagine doing my little doodle, and I would say to myself, maybe I'll win too. But this was something that Jordan had decided he would do. But Jordan was also a man who actually had great affinity because he not only donated the Boston Opera House to Boston, but he also gave Jordan Hall at the New England Conservatory of Music. So even though he was a very wealthy man, thanks to our parents and grandparents buying from Jordan Marsh, he gave back to the people of Boston tenfold. After his death in 1916, his vice president, George Mitten, became president and he would be the first of three Mittens who were presidents between 1916 and 1963. George Mitten had been educated at Suffolk University, which was a commuter college in the period of the early teens. But when he was president, he realized in some ways that the workforce at Jordan Marsh, which at any given time between 1900 and 1930 averaged 1,800 people in one store, was an important feature. Each of these people, in many instances, had been with them for decades. And this tablet was placed to the left of the employee's entrance on Chauncey Street, and it still stands there, and it says, Here and after, there shall be no such term as a Jordan Marsh employee. From here on, we are all fellow workers, regardless of our position with the company. Now, if that happened, and we were the employees, we'd say, That's incredible. We're all in it together and it's really quite important. Well, he had started in 1919 the Quarter Century Club, and for every employee in his employ for 25 years or more, they would receive a small gold medallion that had five blue stars each five years. They also received a check for $1,000, and there was a luncheon for them at the Statler Hilton. But by 1926, he started the Half Century Club. Now, can you imagine a business in this day and age having employees for 50 years or more? They must have started when they were six years old. But the whole idea was, this was a group of women on the right-hand side. Now, they look quite happy. Beautiful hats, corsages, and they've got their white gloves. But they're being handed a check for $3,000 each a platinum brooch with five one-eighth carat diamonds representing each decade, and a luncheon for all of their family and friends they could invite up to a dozen apiece at the Statler Hilton. For someone to take such an effort to make people realize that they too were part of a business, and they were really the meaning of what Jordan Marsh was because they were the face of the company, by 1964, these women, who were the 50-year inductees, look at the hats, the corsages, the minks, and you see in the very center back row, Edward Richardson Mitten, who had just stepped down as president. He became chairman of the board in 1964, and on the far left was a man named Thornton uh, Cameron, who was the new president of Jordan Marsh. In this instance, they realized that their employees were their mainstay, and for them to serve for 50 years was something that not only had at least 100 people, but every year that annual luncheon not only included the present members, but the new people with their family and friends. But when I wrote this book on Jordan Marsh, I was fascinated. Of course, it closed when I was fairly young. I was still, I think, in graduate school. But the idea was, the things that I began to read about was something that nobody ever knew about. Did you know that Jordan Marsh had a Thanksgiving Day parade? 
Oh, you did? Oh, well, you know more than I do. Well, one of the things, no, you aren't, you aren't. Well, the thing is, not only is it something that I do every Thanksgiving morning with the turkey in the oven, a martini in one hand, and patting the dog in the other, I watch the Macy's Day Parade. I love it. But when I was doing this research, beginning in 1929, Jordan Marsh offered what they called the Santa Sun Parade. I had never heard of it. And it was somebody who told me a story, and I went on to eBay, and what do I find but a photograph of the Jordan Marsh Thanksgiving Day Parade. I don't know whether I was more astonished to realize there was a parade in Boston that I had never heard about, or the fact that Santa had a son. <laughs> but here, Santa Claus, with his son, stand on a wonderful banquet on the back of a truck, and they would actually go from Kenmore Square in Boston all the way on Beacon Street to Beacon Hill, and then turn down Park Street and Winter Street to Jordan Marsh. Between 1929, at the height of the Depression, and of course 1943, this was something that had balloons that were sometimes three and four stories in height. Now this balloon, I assume, is an insect. I have no idea. But look at the men holding it. These were men that were dressed as men from China, Arabians, Celts, along with spears and sh uh, shields. But they were things that were usually done by men who were employees of Jordan Marsh in the early part of the 30s. And of course, there were only just so many men. But by the mid-1930s, they began to solicit young men in colleges because 12 men were required for every single balloon. My father is said to have actually been one of the guide wires when he was at Harvard in 1938. But these were things that even showed disembodied heads. <laughs> the men actually hold it. But you look at the costumes. They're these infantry from Prussia in the period of the 1860s and 1870s. During this period, it brought thousands of people on Thanksgiving morning. And it would go from 9 a.m. until noontime. And eventually, when it received the um, aspect, it approached the receiving station at the State House, many people realized that this was something that was great, not only for advertising, but publicity, but for sales, because it spurred on the day after Thanksgiving that, of course, all of the sales for the holidays would take place. But my favorite balloon was four stories in height, and it was the double-headed giant. Now look at this guy. He has pierced earrings. He has not only a bandana on his head, and he carries a spiked mace. So I think sometimes when we realize the thousands of people that would show out for this was something that not only made Jordan Marsh well-known, but it attracted such a huge crowd. Well... By the late 1940s, Jordan Marsh was nearing on its 100th anniversary. Founded in 1851, by 1951 they had hoped to build an entirely new building between Washington Street, Summer Street, Chauncey Street, and Avon Place. And they hired a company that would actually design this in such a way that it was a modern approach to a department store. They hired Perry, Shaw, and Hepburn a very well-known company that got their claim to fame for the restoration of Colonial Williamsburg for the Rockefeller family. But they actually were designing in the 1930s not only college campuses, but boarding school campuses. And this building seen here was what was the first step to what they hoped would be the entire building. This is at the corner of Chauncey and Summer Street. And as you can see, this was a modernistic approach with classical revival details red brick, and of course, colonial revival details with a tip of the hat to Boston's architecture. But this had electric elevators, electric escalators, radiant heat, radiant lighting, and of course, the sidewalks were heated. So no rain, snow, or ice could deter you from shopping at Jordan Marsh. When it was founded, in some ways, in 1851, it was a small store. Now it had 224 departments, and on its 100th anniversary, on that corner, was a three-story tall neon light. And when it blinked, it said the 100th anniversary of Jordan Marsh. I can imagine walking by it. It might blink every half minute, so it was something you saw. But can you imagine being a competitor in the neighborhood and it blinked every half minute for 365 days? It must have been a bit irritating.
But even Jordan Marsh was getting in on this, and they said to themselves they wanted to do a dinner plate that you could buy and serve dinner for your family and friends on. And this was the 100th anniversary dinner plate. And in the center was what Perry Shaw and Hepburn had envisioned for the new Jordan Marsh. But on the rim were all of the former buildings they had been located in between 1841 and, of course, 1871. The interior of this building was incredible, and I'm sure you all remember. It was something that was bright, elegant, and modern for, of course, the 1950s. But in this instance, this was the men's clothing department that had shirts. Now, these shirts weren't just any old shirts. These shirts went the gamut from a 13 neck to a 30 neck. And they had different types of cotton. So if you said, I want a cotton shirt, the clerk might say to you, well, what kind of cotton? Egyptian cotton, Oxford cotton, Pima cotton, brush cotton. And of course, was it white? Was it blue? Was it striped? And in that instance, that was truly what a department store was. But they also provided ties, handkerchiefs, and of course, even suspenders and belts. But during that period, their sales continued to increase tremendously. But the whole idea was, in 1943, the parade had been discontinued. The silk of the balloons was necessary for the war effort and the helium as well. So when the balloons stopped being floated on Thanksgiving Day, Jordan Marsh kept wondering what to do. They had actually been decorating the new building's parapet with the life-size nativity crash, Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus, the three kings, shepherds, and sheep. You might remember as you ascended from the subway, either on the orange line or the red line, you would see this with a backdrop with twinkling lights that represented stars, and of course the star of Bethlehem surmounting it. The department store windows not only showed the latest fashions, but different things that you too could purchase for your Christmas presents. And there was also the fact that Santa Claus was waiting for you at Jordan Marsh. Normally, during the period of even the late 19th century, there'd be little buttons that said, meet me at Jordan Marsh with Santa Claus's face. Seen here in the early 1960s, one child seems extremely happy to meet Santa Claus. The other one a little less happy. But in a little area where elves would hand out candy canes, you too could have your photograph taken with Santa Claus. But one of the biggest things that they ever did was the enchanted village of St. Nicholas. Now, after World War II, Edward Richardson Mitten was somebody who had seen all of his imports from Germany completely stopped. No longer did we trade with East Germany, but we no longer traded with West Germany. And during that period, probably 15% of the stock at Jordan Marsh had actually come from Germany. By the period of 1957, he had continually petitioned the federal government to allow him to re-establish trade with Germany, West Germany, I should say. And in that period, it was finally permitted in 1958. And he did something that many people thought of that was unusual, and he created what he called the Enchanted Village of St. Nicholas. It was a village of three-quarter scale of 24 individual tableaus that had automatons that were men, women, children, and animals that would simply move. And as people went through these individual walkways and leaned on stanchions, seen here you might see a small shed with a cow and a calf and chickens and ducks and that freaky little elf on the lower right hand side. But the idea was that on the day after Thanksgiving in 1959, there were 25,000 people standing in line at Jordan Marsh. And this was something that you would realize that would have these individual tableaus that might go from a bakery, a music shop, a parlor in a Victorian house, or even, as you see in the lower area where I was always told I was going to be left, the village jail. But the whole idea here was that you would look through the window and you would see these individual figures moving. And the whole idea was there was also an orchestra that would serenade you. Jordan Marsh hired a trio from the Sherry Biltmore, which was a hotel on Massachusetts Avenue at Boylston Street. And these men would dress in Tyrolean outfits as well as lederhosen, and they would actually serenade people with Germanic music. 
They might go to the glass blower shop. And of course, seen here on the left, the automaton would raise his glass blowing tube. And if he could, he would blow the ornaments that were hanging, not only from the shelf directly above, but were beautifully wrapped in individual boxes. Well, if you like this, you could buy them on the gift shop on the way out. They also had the schoolmaster's room. And here, the automaton would simply move as the children held not only individual slates, but wrote on the blackboard and read in books. And there was also a bakery. And this baker, who was an automaton, would lift trays of real cookies and place them on the counter, as you see in the foreground. Well, each of these had children that were actually employees' children that were brought in for a photograph session by Look Magazine. And this was a 12-page article in full color talking about the enchanted village of St. Nicholas. This was something that every month Jordan Marsh would have a full-page article, mostly just illustrations, in every newspaper in Boston creating the hype for the enchanted village. Each of these were important because even the bakery here would serve the German cookies in their bakery so that you too could buy them and bring them home. Well, it was so successful its first year with over a quarter of a million people visiting that the German government gave an award to Edward Richardson Mitten, not only for reestablishing trade with West Germany, but also for actually showing in some ways that so close after the end of World War II that at least something had come in a positive manner. Edward Richardson Mitten is second from the left. The man on the left is the German ambassador of the United States. The man on the far right is the German consul to Boston. And in the very center, holding that parchment, was Hans Hoffmann, the man who created those automaton figures. It was his family business that had begun in the 1870s making German toys for the Duke of Coburg in Germany, would actually, by this period in the 1950s, continue the business making automatons. Well, Jordan Marsh was still not only a place where you could shop in person, but their catalogs, and this is 1950 for Christmas, was something that said that Christmas gifts for all the family from New England's largest store. And we see Santa Claus, obviously he didn't come down the chimney, but the children on the left, the boy has a Hopalong Cassidy hat and holster set. The little girl holds a Madame Alexander porcelain doll from Paris. And the boy sitting there has not only a fire engine on the left, but a truck on the right. Each of these were filled with everything for men, women, and children. And these were an important feature because you could order them either by mail, postal, or as well as even by telephone. And during the period, especially of the 1950s, Toyland was located on the fifth floor of the annex. And here, in that double-plated glass window, Santa Claus in 3D opens a book, Tales from Mother Goose. And where does Mother Goose and all of her sheep go? Toyland. Toyland had the best selection of toys in all of Boston. This was actually a railroad set that probably was the size of this room. Not only did the trains go through hills, dells, and valleys made of styrofoam, but there were little villages. And you can imagine, as you see in the photograph, not only young children, teenage children, but even adults looking at these that would run from the time the store opened until the store closed. I received my first farm train set in uh, 1957 when I was born. I guess it's an antique now. But this was something that was $22.50, which was a considerable sum of money. But you could add to it to make a much larger train set. But these were the things that you could usually have at home, not the one the size of this room. But they also provided toys such as airplanes and ships. And these photographs, all from the late 50s and early 60s, show the aspect of trains and planes and ships and even race car sets. And this figure eight race car set, which was a fairly large area, would see children of all walks of life coming to see these things. It was almost as important to realize that even though it might be on your wish list, you might get a reduced version of what you see in the foreground. But whatever it was, between the day after Thanksgiving and Little Christmas, Jordan Marsh, 
among other department stores, made at least 35% of their average annual sales. And in this instance, just before Christmas, this woman is wrapping a battleground play set. Do you remember the twine with a little wooden handle that would be placed and you could carry it home? Well, she looks a little bit dazed, I probably would too. Many of these people would work right up until closing time on Christmas Eve. But the aspect of Jordan's was the fact that in some ways they also provided one of the best bakeries in Boston. And seen here in a photograph of 1963, on the right-hand side is a specialty department where you could order fruits, not only beautiful pyramidal things, but also all sorts of candies and gourmet items that could be sent either to a ship or even to family and mem members and friends. But on the left-hand side was a bakery and do you remember taking the ticket and then holding it and hoping they still had Jordan Marsh blueberry muffins? They usually sold out by 1 p.m. But this was an important feature because the Jordan Marsh Bakery, which had started in the period of 1911, was famous for its delicious blueberry muffins, and this was an advertisement for an experienced baker and baker apprentice. Now, surprisingly, there were 24 at any given time. They worked from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. They had liberal fringe benefits, store discount, and we realized in some ways that this was a major feature, that these all men would actually in some ways make the best known Jordan Marsh blueberry muffin. Now I saw them earlier, they look delicious, but there are two different versions of this blueberry muffin. Some, they're regular muffins that are made with regular blueberries. But I think one of the things is that they did was to freeze half of the blueberries and slightly mash the other half. And when they were mixed together, they created that little bit of a consistency with the crystallized sugar on the top that none of us can ever replicate. It's a memory from the past. But during that period, if you didn't want to wrap your presents, you could simply use a Jordan Marsh gift box. And it said a joyous Merry Christmas with a stagecoach with outriders and four horses. But if you wanted to go to the gift shop where they would wrap your presents, they usually allowed two or three that were not charged. But if you wanted something that was beautifully done with a huge bow to impress the person to whom you were giving the gift, it might cost you a dollar twenty-five. Well, during this period, the company had grown tremendously, just like many of the other department stores. And after World War II, especially because of the war, many of our fathers and grandfathers, along with our mothers and grandmothers, had returned from the war, and they actually began to celebrate with the GI Bill. The GI Bill allowed many people to go back to college, or even others to start college. But it was an important feature to realize that by the 1950s, many people were moving out of the inner city, and they were moving to the suburbs. And Jordan Marsh realized that, and they established their first suburban store in Framingham, Massachusetts. Route 9 was a new route that was seeing tremendous development in the late 1940s right through to the 1990s. And Jordan Marsh decided to have a large store there that actually catered to the people that were moving to the western suburbs. And seen here in a photograph of 1953, it was also the fact it was the ascendancy of the automobile, that many people didn't simply walk or take the streetcar to the store, now they drove. Now this was something that was quite unusual. Does anybody remember the Framingham store? Well, surprisingly, it was a domed store, and it was a large dome. The first and largest domed building in the world is the Vatican. The second is St. Peter's Cathedral in London. And do you know that George Marsh in Framingham was the third largest dome building in the world? <laughs> it was something that had everything that downtown Boston did, of course, on a reduced version. But it was a major feature showing Jordan Marsh now moving into the aspect of the suburban shopping malls. And seen here at the corner of what is today Chauncey and Summer Streets, Jordan Marsh and company continued until 1996. And though it was part of the federated department stores, previously allied department stores, they were part of a consortium of different department stores that pooled their money to buy things and actually sell them at a better price. 
The unfortunate thing was the biggest of them was at Allied Macy's department store. And Macy's would actually buy out Jordan Marsh in 1996. The company no longer existed, though I always tell people, just give me a half hour, I'm just going to run down the street to Jordan Marsh to buy my socks and handkerchiefs and I'll meet you so and so. And everyone says, where is Jordan Marsh? <laughs> well, Jordan Marsh is here. The book itself is something in some ways that I thought would chronicle not just the largest department store in New England, but some place where some of us might have acquired our wedding gown. My first communion outfit came from Jordan Marsh. I was photographed every year in their wonderful photographic studio. And there wasn't a year that I didn't go at least two or three times to the enchanted village of St. Nicholas. But my biggest memory was, of course, the Jordan Marsh blueberry muffin. It's something that continued with, of course, Jordans at Avon, Massachusetts, something that has a little bit of a pun with the name. But you realize in some ways that this is a delicious memory from the past. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions or comments? Please. Well, if you were so darn successful, why did you close the store? Well, it wasn't me, kiddo. <laughs> the problem was they were actually part of the Macy's part of the Federated Department Store. And Federated Department Store had probably 50 or 60 different department stores under the umbrella. And because they were not modernizing as quickly as other stores were, especially Filene's. Think of the Filene's and all of the different malls. They're very upbeat and very calculated. Jordan's had this stuffiness of a Victorian era. When you went into the store in downtown Boston, we always went at the white sale in January. The floors creaked. The stairs creaked. There were potted palms that had seen better days. But the whole idea was, in some ways, that in the first... 100 years, there were only five presidents. And between 1964 and when they closed in 1996, there were 17 presidents. So you can see that aspect of not reinvesting in the business, and people were becoming somewhat tired of it because it was nothing new, nothing unique. Filene's really did continue, but I think in a lot of ways it was indicative of the fact of people going to the suburbs. And online shopping is what really kind of killed it. Any other questions? Uh, please. I grew up in Sumble. My mother was from Cambridge, so we were always in Jordan Marsh. A couple of times a year they had a sale, and they called it the Jordan Marsh Warehouse. Yes. Where exactly was that? Well, Jordan Marsh Warehouse was in Squanum. And the thing was, in some ways, just like Filene's basement and Jordan Marsh basement, they actually had more furniture that went out there. And there were some very lovely things. And when I was very young, after graduate school, when none of us had any money, I remember buying two velvet wing chairs and a couple of other little things. I only just got rid of them. They had been reupholstered. But they were like $99 a piece. And I said, oh, I love these things. And I kind of looked at them quizzically, and I said, oh, I think it's time to get rid of them. <laughs> but yeah, that was something that was incredible, and today the building still stands. And they even sold the blueberry muffins there. Jordan Marsh was more than just a department store. It was a way of life. And I bet everyone here knows someone that not only worked there, but we all probably shop there as well. Any other? Please. Could you speak up? At, in the last couple of months, I went to an auction that brought like this, uh, you know, pottery uh, umbrella stand that actually had a Jordan Marsh. Well, surprisingly, in this book, um, and I do have books here, they're twenty dollars a piece that cash a check. But Jordan Marsh had a pottery department, and you know, when you think of art, pottery, rookwood, and different grooby and different things of that sort. They sold high quality art products and they were umbrella stands, they were vases you could make into a lamp. They did that type of thing. I had a vase that my great aunt had made into a lamp that I took apart, but it had a Jordan Marsh sticker. 
But these are things in some ways that you'll see stickers on many, many things. They even had ready-framed artwork, paintings as well as prints, all sorts of things. Jordan Marsh was really quite a wonderful place, and their furniture was top-notch. It went the gamut from some very expensive pieces, plus an antique shop, all the way down to things like I, my $99 wing chair. Any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, I was one of the brides that was fortunate enough to get a $25 wedding gown. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was in good shape, there wasn't anything. Why not? I mean, I, I have heard stories of people when their daughters are being wed and they have to have two gowns. We have a friend. And the two gowns basically cost $20,000. I say, for what? I'd rather the money for a down payment on a home. But I do a lecture on Filene's. And one of the things is, Filene's had the running of the brides, oh, yeah. like the running of the bulls. Yeah. And I have pictures of these women, and they're in their bras and panties in the middle of, you know, Filene's basement with all these different things. But I think sometimes it's a story. And I bet you get a chuckle out of it every time. $25 for a wedding gown. It's unheard of but it's also something that's yours, and it's important, and it connects you to Jordan Marsh. It doesn't matter if it's a multi-million dollar piece of furniture or art, it's a special thing that we remember, and that's the thing what all of my history is about. Please. I, uh, I'm familiar with your books oh. and uh, your well-known name. I've seen, seen you on uh, Oh, Facebook. you've been at the post office. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if you could tell us how you got into Boston history and where, how it started and where, well, you know, it's led, where it's going. You know, it's so funny. Everyone thinks that I do this for a living. I was treasurer of a company for 42 years. I had a financial career. I realized I taught at... Um, Madison Park High School in Roxbury. I had gone to Roxbury Latin and I thought, oh, I'll teach, I'll, I'll be an inner city teacher. It cured me after one year. <laughs> so I went and I studied uh, at the American Institute of Banking in Bentley and I got an MBA. So I had that career. But I teach at Boston University and I teach history. And I'm trying to engage young people at 18 to 22. Jordan Marsh. Your wedding gown, blueberry muffins, what has this got to do with history? Well, we do things that include sports, Celtics, baseball. We go over to Fen Fenway Park, we walk around, I give a little walking tour. You've got to find history interesting. You've got to find it something that's stimulating. But if the person doing it doesn't make it that way, many people do not even want to hear about it. I'm sure many of you hated history in high school. I loved it. I, I couldn't get enough. But one of the things I've been doing now, and I did retire last year during COVID, um, and I don't regret it. Of course, for the first six months, I just wrote, wrote, wrote. But now I kind of look back and I said, geez, how did I do that all this time? Leaving the Cape at 4.30 in the morning to do my office, especially in the summer. But one of the things is I had a grandfather, my maternal grandfather, who was from Boston. And of course, he took us on walking tours. And my sister could have cared less, but I loved it. But I can remember going through the West End and I can remember the dust and I can remember going through Beacon Hill and... I was fascinated. In my, my teens, I volunteered at the Museum of Fine Arts, and basically starting in my 20s, I was running not only Dorchester Historical Society, but then Milton Historical Society. And what I've tried to do in some ways is, through these books, show people the things that we are familiar with, but our children and grandchildren have no idea what we're talking about. A new series that I'm doing are traditions in Boston, and these are books on Christmas traditions, Thanksgiving traditions, Easter traditions, Valentine's Day traditions just came out, and Halloween traditions will be out in September. And these are things, do you remember going trick-or-treating? Well, the whole aspect about the book is how it arose from a man named Stingy Jack, <laughs> who eventually became the Jack O'Lantern that we know today from Irish folklore, to the costumes and the candy and the decorations. And these are things in some ways that I like. They're not footnoted. Many of my friends will write footnoted books and they're fascinating. And I bet the four of you have read that book and the rest of us could have cared less. But you look at these books and the whole rest of us can look at this as something that is non-threatening, 
beautifully illustrated that makes local history come to life. And my whole aspect is that hopefully this um, October, because we'll be away for September, but this October I'm going to be beginning working with the inner city schools to talk about things like chocolate, baker's chocolate, cranberries, ocean spray, salt, dried fish, as well as, of course, seasoning, all these different things to make people realize that just a little handful of molasses has a whole story to it. But these are things that, you know, it's the type of a thing that you have to do something that makes people really want to sit down and talk to you. And I want to do it with young as well as older students. So hopefully that'll be my next 20 years. Good. Another question. Something that interests me very much about Boston are the uh, roots that, that the immigrants took. Yeah. Yeah. I think they all started out downtown. That's and right. then some went north, some went right. west, some went south. Um, have you? I have. Last, last spring, you know, Alsterville, I mean, we have a place there, and I'm very active in the library. I mean, I just, I do lectures. So they say, can you do something on Irish for March? So I did a thing on the aspect of the Irish ascendancy, and with the first mayor of Boston, Hugh O'Brien, who was actually born in Ireland, right through to the politics of the Kennedys and the Fitzgeralds and Curley and things like that. I'm doing one for the East Boston Library next month on the Italians in Boston. So these are going to probably lead to something. Even though I've done a book on Boston's immigrants, which I use in my course, I juxtapose 19th century immigration trends to 21st century. And, you know, at BU, it sounds peculiar, but many of my students, 70% are foreign-born. Or even students that are international students, that they're going back to their countries of origin. And I think in a lot of ways, Boston has become more diverse in my lifetime than it was in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. You know, Boston was a very stagnant place. And then we began to see from um, Vietnam and Cambodia and different parts of Asia and China. And then, of course, today with the Middle East and even South America, the islands, the Caribbean, Boston is very diverse. And we have a place in the Back Bay, which I hate to say it, it's, it's like white, 70 years old. <laughs> Everyone has the same color hair, <laughs> you know, we all know each other. But the city is a very diverse place, and I, I really enjoy it because when I have my students, I give them like a dozen restaurants, and we each vote upon it, and then we'll go to one place, and that'll be the lecture, and then I take them to dinner. And it might be a Mexican, or it might be a, a Ethiopian we went to one. We went to an Afghani restaurant in Alston one time. I had never had curry go to my life, but I'll never have it again. <laughs> but I thought in a lot of ways it was really important because then they get to choose and they realize too that there are more um, aspects to Boston society than just the things that we're used to. Living outside the box is something that comes hard to a lot of us, but I think sometimes Travel is a way to make you realize in a lot of ways that, you know, there's a broader aspect than just maybe Norfolk. But what I'm saying is in some ways that uh, one time I gave a lecture and this very nice man came up to me and he says, the name like you've got, why are you interested in Boston history? And it made me think, Anthony Samarco, I mean, why am I interested in Boston history? You know, my grandfather was a fruit peddler, he, he sold bananas. He, he knew everything there was about bananas, but he was illiterate. He was illiterate, and he sent my father to Harvard. And I think one of the aspects was that through education, someone was able to become the equalizer. But I'll never forget, he was illiterate. And I used to say to myself, and I tell my students, I mean, I'm not talking the fact that he didn't read or write, you know, read. He really couldn't read or write. And I say sometimes, I guess I'm a good product of that aspect, so. Well, thank you. I do have a few books here if you're interested, and thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you.